Cricket has always been the sport of West Indian people, even at a time when it was not open to the majority. When the first English team to tour the Caribbean arrived in Bridgetown on January 28, 1865, the captain, Slade Lucas, chronicled in his diaries, none of us were prepared for the reception. Every coin of vantage, even the telegraph poles had been seized upon by a struggling mass of black humanity. Yet, the Barbados team that played the Lucas team was all white. In Trinidad, Calypsonians were hailing the great deeds of the cricketing heroes of the day. This was cricket at its best, and Lord's the second test. It is set by everybody. The people not only turned out in their thousands to welcome visiting teams, but also to hail the historic conquerors of 1950 on their return home, the first victorious West Indies side in England. Over the years, characters such as Blue Food also enriched the game with their banter and eccentricities. Times have changed, but West Indian silver for cricket has not. West Indians still greet touring teams with open arms and are these days joined by hordes of cricket fans from abroad. With the ready availability of package holidays out of Europe and North America, cricket tours have become important contributors to the economies of the various territories. There are about 10 to 12 tour operators who are featuring Barbados as a, a sports tourism destination, specifically for cricket tours. We've just got a uh, CTO, the Caribbean Tourism Organization um, um, report, um, scientific um, exit survey, and that was about 8,000 um, British fans here. And uh, the expenditure um, um, is about 29 million US dollars. Um, just over 160, 160 US dollars per person was spent in Barbados. And almost that much would have been spent in Antigua as well. There were also increasing numbers for the matches in Jamaica, Trinidad, Guyana and St. Vincent and the phenomenon is certain to escalate. Television coverage has provided a level of exposure no government could afford to pay for. Images of sun, sea and sand and of forests, falls and fauna beamed back to Britain in the depths of winter is advertising for the region of inestimable value. To meet the growing demand for tickets, the West Indies Board has instituted a modern computerized system while everywhere the need for increased and more comfortable accommodation is being recognized. In Grenada, a completely new stadium is being built just outside St. George's on the site of the old Queen's Park ground. Already granted a one-day international on Australia's 1999 tour, the Grenada project is an incentive for others wanting to join the circuit to upgrade their facilities. More accessible regional air travel and increased affluence has created another new phenomenon, the indigenous posse. Comprising groups of mostly young, well-off fans, they travel from match to match, waving their flags, singing their calypsos, and generally having a good time. They rejoice in their unity as West Indians for all their separate identities as Trini, Bajan, or Jamaican. It could well be an unlikely antidote to the insularity that has always been a part of West Indies cricket and politics. People from Trinidad get behind Brian Lara because he's the captain. People from Jamaica get behind Courtney Walsh, the Antiguans and Kutli Ambrose. Yet, you know, we all have the common goal of watching the West Indies win or wanting the West Indies to win. And I think it, 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 comes, it goes a long way. And I, I think it's the only thing left, the only natural thing left that we do, you know, to unite and support you know, it, to bring together the Caribbean and that's supporting the West Indies cricket team. The posses and the marketing men have turned the cricket into a carnival, an appropriate blend for the Caribbean. And invariably, they get around to chanting the first authentic West Indies cricket anthem, a rousing 1988 composition by the Trinidadian Calypsonian David Rudder. It's our anthem. It's our cricket anthem. It, it brings the Caribbean people together when we hear rally rally around the West Indies, you know. We, we feel a kind of feeling that brings us as one. I'm a Caribbean man in the first instance, and uh, cricket is the thing that, you know, unites us. 
and I felt, you know, maybe I should use cricket as a metaphor for the wider Caribbean idea that I have of us coming together. You know, we had a federation before which failed. CARICOM, CARIFTA, everything is sort of like you're trying something still. So I just try to use music uh, as a form uh, to get the message across and cricket, based, you know, because it's our strongest unifying force to, um, you know, really stamp that message through to the people. Characters are still entertaining spectators, now far more outrageously than those of earlier times. These days, Gravy dangles from his perch at the Antigua Recreation Ground, cross-dressed in a nurse's outfit or a sequined party dress, and challenges his great rival Mayfield to mock boxing bouts on the outfield. On the more cerebral side, while no other work has come to rival CLR James's 1963 classic Beyond the Boundary for its clear analysis of the role of cricket, the game has rightfully taken its place on the syllabus of the University of the West Indies, where the Center for Cricket Studies has been established at its Cave Hill campus. The game and its strict set of codes has for many Caribbean intellectuals served as a prism through which to view West Indian life. I believe that West Indies cricket, as test cricket, has declared West Indian independence. The only West Indian nation that exists is the West Indian cricketing nation. It is for us now to set about building a West Indian nation in cricketing terms too. All of this in ironic contrast to an unmistakable decline in interest in cricket among the young, to the extent that the February 1998 survey taken in schools in Antigua, one of the strongest cricket cultures in the region, indicates that the game is now third to basketball and soccer in popularity. I like to watch Ambuz and Lara and those guys. I like it. I like it, but I don't like to play it, but I like to watch it. I have been looking around at cricket grounds, I've been to basketball courts. I'm seeing young, energetic, tall Antiguans, six feet five, six feet six, and they are dunking. I'm saying, maybe, there goes an Ambrose. Maybe there goes a holding. We remember clearly Ambrose's first love was basketball. And it's by some slight luck, or large luck, that West Indies did get Ambrose to switch from basketball to cricket. And I'm saying, how many Ambroses that we have lost in that very process? I think the main problem with West Indies cricket is to get it being played back in the schools, all the schools, and on a regular basis. Um, I think this is where we've lost both in the quality and the amount of players coming through, and we've also lost it in terms of spectator support, because if you don't have an affinity for a game when you're young, you're not going to translate it by being paid for it, by paying for it to go and see it at the gate. Um, this is something that we will be trying our best to, to do, uh, to foster, but unfortunately it is something that really has to be done by the governments themselves. I mean, they have to take the lead. The Antigua situation may, however, be isolated, as results of a regional survey commissioned by major sponsor Cable & Wireless one month later shows cricket to be the preferred sport of West Indians. It is clear, as we enter the new millennium, that the West Indies Cricket Board and its member associations will face mounting challenge from other sports. Don't hold me too high.